Hello, everyone. Welcome to the May Edmonton R user group meetup. We have Henrik Bengtsson here, who is going to talk about the future package, how it came to be and what it does and what lies in its future of the future. And I just have a few opening slides. So the Edmonton R user group is an R enthusiast group. We host mostly online events once a month. And a couple of those happen either in a hybrid mode or sometimes fully in person. And uh, if you want to learn about R, then this is the right place to be, usually on the last Thursday of every month. But now it's a Monday because sometimes we need to accommodate schedules of people. We're located on Treaty 6 territory which is traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples. And we also live and create and code here. So thank you for this opportunity to be part of the community. We have a few sponsors, the R Consortium and Analytium Solutions, who have uh, offered us some uh, help with hosting meetings and uh, our meetup site and have a talk about the Futureverse, which is a unifying parallelization framework in R for everyone. And uh, Henrik is here to give us this talk. And uh, I can introduce him to some extent, and he might then uh, tell us what I left out. So Henrik has a degree in computer science and also mathematical statistics. He's currently an associate professor and uh, University of California, San Francisco, member of the R Foundation and author of many packages, most notably the future package. And that's what he's going to talk about today. Hi, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I have not been to Edmonton. I, the closest I've been is Calgary. Um, so I don't know. If they're like competing cities, I'm curious to hear about that. Uh, of I would love to have join you on site uh, for a pizza and meet meet you there, but uh, that has to be another time. <laughs> um, but I promise when I'm up there, I will reach out. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for hosting. Yeah. So um, I'm Henrik Bengtsson. Uh, it's I'm from Sweden. That's my background. Um, and I do applied research. That's been my way of working since day one. I like theory, but I also like that the methods we develop gets implemented and used in science. Um, I am an engineer by heart. That means I use a lot of words. Uh, I use the word but a lot. I think scientists use the word and more. So, but 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 doesn't mean I'm like negative and skeptic. I'm just asking questions to learn more. Um, maybe you can relate to this. Um, okay. So the future verse um, came about. The first iteration was probably back in two thousand five. Uh, I did a postdoc visit down in Australia in Melbourne, and uh, we worked with a lot of sequence, not sequence data, microarray data, but DNA data and RNA data, genomics data. And at the time, big data at that time was one data file might have been 50, 100 megabytes. And when you get like six, seven, eight of those, it became big. And it take a long time to run it and you run out of memory and stuff. We're in a completely different ballpark now, uh, 20 years later, but it's uh, that's where it started. So it's like, had to do things large scale. Uh, it had to work on Linux. Mac wasn't really around at that time, not that common, and also on Windows. And we had collaborators on all these platforms. Some people had like big compute clusters, big computers. Some had like very small computers. And we developed genomics data and methods, and we wanted everyone to be able to run it. Um, and then quickly, 
we handle the memory and then the quickly is like how can i run things faster because these things took hours and sometimes days to run so someone said can we paralyze and um, we started to provide certain type of paralyzation in r and then someone said i have this and have this and we start adding more and more solutions <laughs> and that worked well for 10 years but it became like a major hassle so 2015 i decided okay let's tear this down and rewrite it from scratch and that's how the future verse and the future package came about um i should also say please feel free to interrupt at any time i have the chat window open too so if you want to have questions please post them there so why do we paralyze uh I think there are different reasons why we paralyze, but the most common one is to speed up the processing. And that's what I call the wall time. If we have 100 tasks and they take one hour each, it will take 100 hours. And we, so that takes four or five days. So how can we have that finish sooner? So a shorter wall time that can be done by paralyzing uh, on the local machine or across many machines. Sometimes we also want to paralyze because we have a big memory footprint. We can't handle all the data in one on one machine. So we run subtasks in multiple machines. Of course, we can do that sequentially on one machine too, but we also paralyze because we can't handle it on one machine. Uh, sometimes we need to avoid data transfers because data is so big and people working in astronomy they know this is like they can't afford to send the raw data from a telescope to a central data center it's just too big so they have to compute out into different distributed locations and summarize it and then send over the summary um, other reason can also be uh, things like asynchronous uh, graphical user interfaces like shiny uh, I will focus on the, this, the most common one, speed up processing time. Um, for that, we have options we can paralyze on the local laptop or your work desktop. And if you're single users, you don't have to worry much about other things running on this machine. So you can just paralyze as much as you want. Uh, quite common is also smaller labs to have one or two powerful computers, but they are shared by many people. So you might end up paralyzing together with other people. Um, it could also be in a situation where you have multiple computers sitting in office and they mostly sit idle. So with the future verse, uh, it will be possible to use those as long as you can SSH into them and they have R installed. Um, so this going to, that's very simple with the future verse. Uh, you might also do the same thing in the cloud. You might run virtual machines in the cloud and you can parallelize to those. Other people have uh, access to high performance compute clusters. They are, if you don't know where they are, uh, I mean, maybe we, you can say if you know <laughs> someone who don't know, um, but they are anything from like 50 computers to several hundreds or thousands of computers, and they are connected on the same local network. They have the same file system, so they all see the same files. Uh, but the way you use it is not that you log into each of the machines and run things. You actually submit batch jobs or scripts, maybe shell scripts or maybe R scripts and to a queue. And then there is a scheduler. Um, here I'm showing Slurm is a common one. Another is uh, Sun of Grid Engine. Um, there are a few different uh, styles. And they will take your tasks and all the other 100 users on this uh, cluster, and they will make sure people's jobs get run. But these are typical things. You send it off, and it takes a few minutes or hours or days for things to finish. I just wanted to interject because yeah. we have people from Canada and they might or might not know that there's a something used to be called Compute Canada and now they're sure. calling it a Research Alliance and uh, they offer uh, free 
high performance computing resources for academic institutions or people affiliated with these. So that's a pretty incredible resource. I heard I heard of that. That's true. It's uh, yeah. If you haven't uh, done it, it's if it's the hurdle is not that big if you know how to run a script from the command line in R. We can it's first time you do it's like super fascinating. You can send off like thousands of things at the same time. And you can't do that on your laptop. Yes. Yeah, they have so boot camps usually. So if you want to learn more, you can just sign up and then uh, they'll show you how how to sign up and uh, start running jobs. Highly recommend it. <clears throat> so, but let's go back and look at what's already available in R before Futureverse came about. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying this is if you search online or Stack Overflow, you will get into these and see these different solutions that already exist. Um, so one famous solution is uh, comes with R itself. So I will show you this. Uh, it's built in an R, so every R installation has it. Uh, here is a toy example, a mock-up. Uh, I have a package called DNA Seek. It doesn't exist, but it's illustrating the point here. You load a package. There is a, the FQ vector here is pointing to three different files on the file system. And in genomics, these are called FASTQ files. They have uh, DNA sync whistings. So it could be three different people, patient A, B, and C. And you want to study their genomics data. So the first thing what we need to do with these, these are raw, very raw data. So it's just scattered sequences. We want to align them onto the genome. So we put basically it's think about it as a big puzzle. We have the pieces, but we need to put together the picture. Putting together the picture is that align functions as part of the DNA seq package. So the way we would do this in base R we say use the L apply function to iterate over each of these elements or these files and call the function align. And that align function will then load the file in the memory, map it to the genome, and then it will write back the results to files, what we call these files dot bam in the end. So these are genomic technical details, but it reads from file because these files are very big and writes them back to file. Okay. The one way we can do parallelize this in R is to say, use the parallel package and MCL apply. And this one would say, it looks very similar to L apply, but it's just having MC before, and then you specify how many parallel workers you want to use at the same time. So here we want to use three different, in this example, I use three different. So if each sample of patient takes one hour to align, this will finish in one hour because we run three things in parallel. The sequential version would take three hours. Uh, there is also that only works for Unix and Mac because it's used something called fork parallelization, which is part of operating system, and that's not supported in R for Windows. So there, you can use another approach, which also works on Unix and Mac. By the way, it's where you create a cluster of workers. So this command make cluster would actually spin up three different R processes in the background, almost like you would do it manually but it, they do it in background. And the first thing you say, you tell each of these parallel workers to load this package because it needs that. Uh, just like you have to do it in your main R session, is you have to tell the parallel workers. And then you say par for parallel, L apply. Um, you do it very similar to the previous one across the elements you want to operate the function and then you specify what your cluster of workers are and this would also run in the background and finish in one about one hour okay so these are very common uh, approaches out there um, there's another one called for each i will show that later so there are a few things we need to be aware of mcl apply it's magic uh, that's why it's so commonly suggested among people on Mac and Linux. 
but it actually has problems rarely discussed. Um, but it's very simple to do. You can just take an L apply and call MCL apply. Um, you don't have to worry about, I will talk about that later, global variables and loading packages. It will just do it for you. And that's because it's using fork processing, but it's not supported in Windows. It can also be very unstable uh, on what's called multi-threaded code. This is very technical, but there's actually code and R packages that if you try to use MCL apply on them, they would just crash R. Um, it's very unfortunate. Uh, it's also our studio console is not uh, handling MCL apply and fork processing very well. So they recommend against it. Um, and also how errors are produced. If you have an error, if you call something that gives uh, negative values are not uh, supported, you have to take care of them specially. So it takes a little bit more work. Okay. And this is what Simon Urbanek uh, says. He's the author of that MCL apply. He's part of our core. He's saying, do not use it by default. So do not write a package or code that just use this because you never know if it's supported by your, where the user is running your code or script. So you have to be very careful about that. I just want to raise that it's like uh, it's sold as a magic solution, but there are a lot of things you have to worry about. And sometimes you don't discover them after until like a few months later. Uh, Par L apply uh, takes some efforts, but is much more stable in this sense. Um, and when you use it, you know it works on all operating systems. Uh, it requires you to like load packages manually on the workers. You need to export data send data from your main computer over to these workers. And you also have to be a little bit more careful with errors and stuff like that. Um, okay. Yep. And let's look at some common design patterns here. Um, so if, we, if you go and look at packages in CRAN or the Bioconductor, um, and maybe some of you can relate to this. So say you have this function L apply and you want to, I think it's too tedious to write L apply this. Uh, I might call create a function on top of it called align everything or align all. So when you use it, you take these files as input and you just call this and you get the results back. So that's a first step that we simplify code. And of course there can be much more thing going on inside here, but this is a toy example. So now say, hey, I want to parallelize this. So first thing you could do is like do this. And you, you say, I want to have an option to parallelize it. So you add a, an argument called parallel. And then you say, OK, by default, it shouldn't run in parallel. Uh, so default, when you call this, it will still use the L apply solution as sequential. But for those who want to run it in parallel, they can just pass, call this function with parallel equal to true. And it will then use the MCL apply. And here I will use all the cores on the machine or what's available to the uh, R process. So this is quite a uh, convenient and neat extension of your function. You can say parallel equal to true. Of course, we forgot that this won't do anything good for a Windows user. And what actually will happen, it will run uh, an L apply for Windows. So it won't run in parallel on Windows. Um, and then you say, hey, if I run on, on a shared machine, maybe I don't want to use all the cores. I want to give the end user an option to choose this. One approach is to do this. You don't specify that here in your code. But instead, you let the user set MC course equal to four if they want to use force. That's one approach. This is, uh, you can see this if you look at different R packages. They, some do this. Uh, others do this. They say specify a number of cores as an argument, and the default is one sequential. So if you have one, you run sequentially. Otherwise, you 
run MC apply for this number of cores, and the user can use this. It's so very common. And then someone say, hey, what about Windows? Okay, so now you in your code, now you're going to say if they ask for more than one core, and if you run on Windows, you're going to create this cluster. And when this function ends, it's going to stop the cluster. You load the package on the workers, and you might have some global variables you need to send over to the workers, and then you call this function parallel apply. If you're not on Windows, you will use the MCL apply. And if you don't parallelize, it will L apply. So this is a very common way of packages being growing over time and as more and more users are. And then someone said, hey, I know of this other fancy parallelization methods that might have a compute cluster or a slurm or can you support that too? And he said, sure, I can do that. And then several years later, it's like, oh my God, I have all this version 99. Um, you have to support everything. There's a cluster MQ package that does this, this, you can use that for on the compute cluster and there might be other things going on. So your code starts looking like this. And all it does is just an apply on a function in different ways. And you can imagine how easy it is to do mistakes here. And you how do you test that this code works? R has this beautiful setup of checking R packages, but in order to make sure this works, you have to run your data through all these different conditions um, to make sure it works. So it's like your test coverage is going to be very low. Most likely you might just test on L apply and maybe MCL apply or maybe just this and L apply. So it's there's a lot of unknowns when you develop packages like this. So this was one reason why the future framework came about is like the code becomes very cluttered. You can't really see what's going on here. It's mostly orchestration. Um, so future package attack this problem. And it looked, if you look at the different solutions, so we've seen the parallel package has MCL apply and parallel apply. Uh, we haven't mentioned, I only mentioned for each, but I haven't shown it, but for each is a very common one, um, which can parallelize in a similar way. Uh, if you're in the bioconductor world, there's the BIOC parallel, they have their bio BP, L apply, et cetera. And then there are other solutions too out there. But what they all have in common is that they have some what I call map reduce functions. They take a vector of input and they apply it to a function and they send it out to parallel workers somehow. And then they collect the results. Um, they uh, several of them have options to support different types of parallel backends, it's a little bit on your local machine. For each has a few different alternatives. BIOC parallel has other alternatives. Um, they also try to be efficient how you distribute things out to the different workers. Some of them try to automatically load packages and globals. Uh, some don't. Errors, warnings, and output is so and so, but they all have this in common. They try to do very similar things and provide you with one function that makes it simple for you. Um, so what the future API is like, identify those common needs and say, let's rewrite that. And you can imagine that all these could then use future API instead. Uh, so the Purpose of it is, is to serve a low level parallelization task in a very standardized and consistent manner. And we will get to that later. It's like, doesn't matter if you use for each BIOC parallel or other things, they will behave the same way. Okay. So it's a package came out 2015, uh, first release, I think. And uh, the gist is that you write your code once and it can run anywhere. And that's the point is if you can change um, where it parallelizes uh, with one single setting, but you don't have to go in and change your code. It's 100% cross-platform. It works with any type of parallel backends that R supports and more are added um, all the time. So it's, um, it's, it's prepared for the future, so to speak. It's a very simple API, I would show. It's very small. 
plain R code, very well tested. Um, and it takes care of a lot of things that you otherwise have to worry about. And sometimes you don't know you have to worry about them, but then some years later, it's like, oh, I need to worry about random number generation when I run in parallel. And this package tried to take care of you and hold your hand for that and make your life easy. Uh, so what is the future and why do we talk about it? Uh, so it's a concept that was invented or coined back in the mid 70s, so 45 years, 46 years ago. Um, and there was three different groups of people that came up basically with the same thing. So a future is an abstraction for a value that would be available later. This is very abstract, but it will become clear later. The state of the future is either unresolved or resolved. You can think about Schrodinger's cat. Uh, as long as you don't lift the lid of the box, it's uh, you don't know if the cat is alive or not. Um, that's the same with the future. Uh, and the value of a future is the result of the expression you say it's to calculate. Um, I will show you. Uh, so if you think about a basic R assignment, so this could be X equals x assigned one plus two. That's an example here. So it has a left-hand side and a right-hand side. And what R does here, when you have code like this, R will take that right-hand side, say it's one plus two or something much more complex that takes longer to run. It will take that and it will immediately run it. And when it's done, it gets a value of that. And then it will say, okay, let's assign it to this variable in this case, the V. Uh, but it's actually two steps here. And that's what the future API allows you to break it up. So the same thing can be written using the futures this way. So you use the function future and saying, I want to calculate this expression. I want the result of this expression. Say one plus two or something very long running. And that function will immediately take that expression. And if you run it in parallel, it will send it off in parallel in the background and return a handle to it. So this is a handle and you get it immediately. So you don't have to wait for this. So you're telling R here is like, I'm interested in this, the value of this expression sometimes in the future. And the sometimes in the future can be immediately. You say, okay, now give me the value of this. And if it's not ready, it will wait for the value to be done, and then you get the value back. But of course, since it's split up, you can do other things in between here, between these two steps. And that's the key to this whole thing. Uh, so let's look at an example. So if you have, let's say we have a task and a function, we want to calculate the sum from the values one, two, three, two, uh, four, up to 100. Uh, and that sum is uh, 5,050. But we have a very slow, function that implements this. And of course, this is a toy example. So this could be another type of function that actually takes time, but this takes two minutes to complete. Uh, because of the behavior of uh, summation, we know that we can split this up in two parts. We can calculate the sum of one to 50 and then from 51 to 100. Um, so we could split this up or we can calculate the first part and since it's half the size, it will probably take just uh, half the time to process one minute. And the value gets assigned to A, and we can calculate the sum of the second part. It will also take a minute, and we get to B. And the, the property of summation allows us then to add these two in one step, reduce it to the end, and we get the same result. So here we haven't gained anything, but it shows that your algorithm, your task can be split up in two pieces. So with futures, we can now run those two pieces in parallel. So this is how you do it, library of future, and you say plan multi-session. This is the one that creates uh, background processes, and these processes are waiting for tasks from your main R session on your local computer. So here is how we do it. The first future, they calculate the sum from one to 50 through this future function. It will send this task off to the background and it will return immediately. So here we're back to the prompt. No waiting here. Same for the second, no waiting. And now we can do other things. 
uh, at the same time on the meanwhile while those two are running in the background and yeah play around here so say now after 50 seconds i will say i'm now interested in the value of one of these let's do the first one i want the value of this since it's only gone 50 seconds and it takes a minute here this will now block for another 10 seconds before the results are back but after 10 seconds we get the results and if you now ask for B, since that also took one minute, it finished at the same time. So this will be instant, it's already available. And now we can do, whoops, now we can do add them up. So here now, we split up these two tasks, run them at the same time concurrently in the background, and we finished in half the time. Just because of the future function and the value function. And we have different ways of parallelization. Default is sequential. We can use multi-core. That's the same as the MCL apply, the fork. So be careful with that. Uh, you can use multi-session. That's very similar to that parallel apply uh, machinery. Um, we can also use a cluster of local computers. So if they call N1, N2, N3, they will work. Uh, we can also have a local computer and two remote computers, one in university and one in the cloud. So if we call do the future A and future B, in this case, one might end up on a local machine and the other one might end up in the cloud. So, um, so this is literally how, if you have all your setup, that's all you need to change. Um, all you need is SSH and R on the other end. You can run it on, a, on HPC uh, scheduler. You can also use the call R package that has some parallel thing. and you can use this backend to use that. Um, okay. So I just want to say that it's taking care of a few things automatically for you. One thing is this, that say you have this function, you want to run that in parallel. You have a, a vector of 100 uh, normally distributed values and you want to calculate the slow sum of that. In order for that to work, if you do that in a, on a parallel computer, imagine it's running a, on a machine across the world, that other machine needs to know about X, and it needs to know about slow sum. And of course, it probably doesn't know that because your X was created in a local machine. So that's what we call a global variable uh, or free variable. So what the future packet does is actually do code inspection on this and trying to figure out what is needed to be sent over to the parallel worker. And I can show you, um, there's a package that allows you to look at an expression in R and it shows, if we do this, the prior package on this expression, we see there's a curly brackets. That's nothing special. This means there's a function call and the function is slow sum and X. So using a similar technique, but much more convoluted and complex, it actually identifies slow sum is of interest, X is of interest. I need to, the future verse will send those two pieces over to the parallel worker. And you don't have to worry about this. You can just write this code. So that's uh, one of the powers of the future verse. Uh, you can do it manually. And if you had to do it manually, you would you have to specify things like this global sequence, slow sum x. And as a reminder, basically all of the other solutions out there forces you to do this. So if you use the parallel make cluster set up on worker x, you have to say cluster export to the workers slow sum x. Then you can call this function slow sum. If you try to call it without export, it's going to give object not found. So, so this is not needed in the future verse, except for very rare corner cases. Um, okay, so I want to sell you this future API once more. Uh, we saw the future pack, future function. We saw the value function. There is one more function called resolved. Um, what that allows you is to ask a parallel worker or a future, are you done yet or not? And it will say true or false, but it, it will not block. So you can peek in 
And if it's not done, you can do other things. So that's key if you want to do asynchronous things, several things concurrently. But these three functions are all we need for parallel processing. And using these, we can build up much more powerful uh, things. That's what I'm going to show you now. So imagine you want to do a parallel version of LApply. So if you, if this is all you know, you don't even have to know about the resolve one, your future and value. You can create your own parallel LApply already now. It has the same input as LApply, but what you do instead of calling LApply, you call LApply on these elements that normally calls the function of each of these elements, but you call it for a future. So what this now will do, if X is 10, it will create 10 futures here. And depending on the parallel backends or sequential or whatever, they will run and be processed. And at the end, you just say, give me the value of these futures and it will return. So this will be a list of 10, 10 futures and this will return the values of those 10 futures as a list. So point here is like future function and value function, very powerful. And the end user can then just call it this way, parallel L apply. And the user can choose, I want to parallelize on my local machine or in the cluster, whatever, by changing this plan. Uh, and of course, there is the package already doing this. Um, so there is a package that provides a lot of these of the common L apply, S apply, T apply, V apply. And it also does it in a slightly more efficient way than we see here. So that's the future apply function. And all you need, if you have an L apply function that you think, oh, it's slow, I want to parallelize this as the developer in a script or a package, you just add future underscore apply in front of this, future underscore. And it will now this call will be able to make use of the whole future verse. Okay. If you like the per and the its uh, API and functions, you can use the map function. Um, and if you would like to write your own parallel map, you this is how you would do it. Uh, you would just use map or per. And very similar to before, you map that into the function call, but through the future. And then and then you call value. And then you have a parallel map function. And that's already implemented in the per package with the pre prefix of future underscore. Um, okay. Uh, now I'm going to touch on the quickly on the for each. Uh, I'm not going to show an example how to implement that, but if you'd seen for each, or you would definitely see it if you don't know about it, um, it's uh, it provides an alternative to L apply and map to to call things. Um, it's not a for loop. It's not a for loop. It's not a for loop. But it looks like a for loop. Uh, but this is how you would do it in in future. If you have a for each with a do, this will run sequentially. If you use percent to future operator, it will be able to parallelize this same thing through the future world. Okay. Um, so point here is it's the future API, the future and the value functions are very powerful. You can build your own. And there are some already pre-created packages uh, that do this. And the future applies one, it allows you to stay with your base R style, if your code is already using that, you can upgrade the code to running parallel. If you're already using the tidyverse style, there is the per package that provides you use that. And if you already use for each, you can you can use the do future to, to parallelize for from the future one. Um, there is also, um, so if you use for each, I assume some of you have already done that. You know there is a function, an operator called do par or do parallel. Um, 
that's the classical style and the, the Futureverse supports that too uh, in the do future package. With this one, what you have to do, you have to register a backend. So you might have seen register, do parallel, do MC. If you want to use the Futureverse, you say register, do future. And then this will run in through the Futureverse. But I recommend this approach that was released this year so after it's it's been in production uh, under development for many years but i recommend this approach um, it's more robust and more consistent but if you have code that already uses this all you need to do is calling register do future and one set of code that is already using dupar is the whole bioconductor bioc parallel world there they say use Redis to do par param to make BIOC parallel use, use this structure inside. And then I say use this to have that use futures. And then you, this function will now look at, will go through the future loops. Um, and then we have Peter's solution back in January. He added support for futures and um, we have the PB up apply package, and there's the L apply for the, the PB up apply, which uh, same same syntax, uh, similar syntax, and you specify CL equal to future, and now now this will be passed on to the future verse to be processed. I will return to an example later too, um, and again, all these things I showed you now. You have the end user, but also you, if you, you, you're the sole user, you can choose for a lot of ways to parallelize. And there are other solutions uh, in being produced, pre created by other people right now. Okay. Um, I show you, I will show you this because I mentioned HPC and the future.batch tools in some of the examples. So there is a package called batch tools. I didn't write it uh, that provides using clusters and send things to the cluster. I wrote a small wrapper package, it's not very big, called future.batch tools that allows you to use futures for their solution. So here is like a piece of code that says, Whatever I parallelize, I want to use the batch tools, Slurm scheduler. Here is an example where I load all the FQ files or FASQ files in the current directory or search, find them. I find 80 files, they have 200 gig each. Each of them takes one hour to process. So this would take 80 hours to complete if I ran them sequentially. If I use future L apply or future underscore map for fur, or for each, they will now, because of this first line here, send them to the job scheduler. And if we look at the log, uh, job scheduler, if I were to log into this cluster and I call a function called SQ, that's part of the cluster in this example, it will list all the running tasks of on this cluster at the same time. Now I can see Alice has one job running. I don't know where that is, but I see two of my jobs here. Um, and they they are created under the hood for this and for the for the future verse. So just to illustrate what it looks like. And since if it's a big enough cluster, I can get all my eighty files running at the same time. So everything can finish in one hour instead of eighty hours. Okay. So. Uh, what, what we manage to do with the future API is that we can, if you use for each, you can build on top of the future API. BIOC parallel the same. We have the future apply, we have the fur, we have do future, PB apply, and others. They can all leverage the same unified API, the same behavior, same uh, strengths and weaknesses. Um, and I also want to point out, if you're interested in the how it works, it's um, 
if we look at MCL apply and parallel apply, uh, if we look at MCL apply, there's actually a function called MC parallel internally. It looks, is very similar to the function future. And then there's MC collect, which is very similar to the function value. So MCL apply could quickly be rewritten internally to use the future API and same for parallel apply. Of course, that won't happen because this is for part of core R, but the philosophy we can even find here. So in my dream world, the R would have a very thin future API and everything builds on top of this. And then hopefully that happens one day. Um, okay. What about outputs and warnings and errors? Um, I will show output and warnings. Errors are just very similar. They, they work out of the box. So regardless of parallel backend, uh, and regardless of you use just the low level future function or future apply or fur or do future, it get, works the same. So take this example here. Um, we have a vector of minus one, 10 and 30. And we want to call log on each of these values. We use L apply for that. And when we do this, we also send a message saying, this is the value we're calculating. So that's what it will look like. It will say minus one, 10, and 30. But because we also get minus one here, log minus one will produce a warning. Okay. So that's what we expect when we run L apply. Um, if you use future L apply, it will behave exactly the same. This output will be truly available here as if it's generated in the previous example, you get the warning. Uh, however, if you look at the other solutions like MCL apply, the message and the warnings are completely dropped. And the same thing if you do parallel apply solution, there's nothing there. Um, there are hacks so you can sometimes see them, but you can kind of only see them. They're actually not sent back to you. Um, so, the future frameworks takes care of output and things like that. And that makes, allows you to do simple debugging. You can look, if you run into bugs, you can just add the print the value and re rerun it and see, ah, oh, the value was negative. I didn't expect that. And we can narrow in on the, on the bug you have. Um, the same thing with, for each, if you do parallel, um, if you try to output messages or if there are warnings, they, they won't appear. Um, but if you use for each with do future, this one, you get them. So this is why I'm saying just try to use the future framework. Your code will look very similar anyway. Okay. Um, and back to PB apply here. It's a, uh, Peter added this back in January. Um, so this is what it would look like if you use the PB uh, L apply for progress bars apply with messages and a warning. Uh, you get the output from this, these messages, uh, and then the progress bar being shown. Uh, so these, these, this output doesn't show up until the end, I think here. Or it actually can appear sooner. Uh, yeah. I, I, and then you get the warning. Um, okay. So, any questions? No. I have a few, but I'll let others speak first. Yeah. There's already 44 slides. Uh, I know it's uh I see it's uh, thanks. Is this the last one? I wonder. No, it's not, but it, it, we can we can quit here if we want to. But there is I one can't... one question that relates to this one and uh mm. that would be can you sync standard output and standard error into a file? Um if uh no uh, you, you you can capture it and do it in the main, but we don't, because the concept of a file 
um, if you run and you're talking on the parallel worker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if what, how would that work? Okay. On your local machine, but say that parallel worker is across the world. Mm -hmm. What good is that file for you? <laughs> um, so in that sense, it's like, then your code would behave differently uh, depending what you're doing. So on purpose, of course it can be done, but it, there is no API for it. Mm -hmm. So it would only make sense on probably local host only. Yes. Um, and the point with the future framework is like everything should work the same regardless of how you mm -hmm. parallelize. So that's why I don't add all the bells and whistles that people want to have because they might only work here and there. Um, but so what's your what's your thoughts around that? Why did I'm you ask? Wondering. That? Sometimes when I'm running jobs, then mm -hmm. I have to have either checkpoints so that I know, okay, let's say your example where you were reading in those files one to eighty, and each one takes one hour. Let's say on an HPC you get kicked out because your time is up. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you might want to know, obviously, in this case, you would know because the BAM file would be there. So you can just read which BAM files you have and then do the rest or randomize them so that you can maybe submit two jobs. Or at least this is what I have done in the past, just save some artifacts. And based on that, you will know what is, uh, yep. what is done. But yeah. uh, that's why and I'm I wondering... I think a lot of us uh, take that approach. We have some kind of log files or whatever and see how far it's got. Um, so that's that's the... Um, so I think the way you're saying is like, if we can send it to file or pipe it to file, and there are ways to do it. Uh, I just don't want to advertise it. Um, but there, there are other ways to do it too. You can actually write saying, I want to... That's that's the one I we can we can skip this, but we can we can use this progressor. Mm -hmm. um, I'll show you. So what happens here, you have have another function called snail, take data input. It's uses future s apply on that, calls a function, which Calls another slow function here. It takes a very long time to run this, and then the end it sums the values. Um, the progress R package where this function is defined, it sets up what we call a progressor along this X. So if there are hundred values, it has hundred steps. And then inside this function, you just say call this P. Uh, I could just call P parenthesis open close but I can also send a message in this case I send a message said equal to the value by the parallel workers process um, so this is and this is how you enable it and then run in parallel and this is what actually looks on your machine it will show the progress bar 10 percent it showed the value that was completed just now on this parallel worker and since we're using we're reporting on progress both for this package and the bpar package you will get some sound too um here a little bit later we see the value 12 by this worker was processed and so on if you change this to cluster on another side of the world this information will still be transferred back to you so point is that it's uh, you don't need that in this case you don't need that local file on the log into that local machine and see how far it's gone because as soon as this function is called here on the parallel worker it sends a signal back to your your computer saying that this is how far i got and since it's running in parallel you're going to get many messages back in parallel um you can imagine having similar things where you have other log you log details. They're like logging frameworks in our logger 
you can imagine that works in a very similar ways. As soon as it gets a log, you send it back to some database. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, okay, let's let's wrap up. I added those as a um, okay. um, point is, um, or take home message with the future framework. Is I hope you use it. Um, I think. Of course, since I since I wrote it, uh, I'm I'm biased, but I think it's uh, the way to do, to use it. Um, it takes care of a lot of things that you otherwise have to worry about. Uh, standard out messages, warnings, in progress to now, um, and uh, it's allow you to write code, prototype it locally, and then you can scale up. And you might not know already now how much you want to scale up, so. You don't, but you don't have to worry about that. So you don't have to use this. If Windows, if Linux, if this and that, you don't have to worry about that. Um, um, yeah, that's it. Um, support is through GitHub discussions. I have two tutorials now on the Futureverse website. There is a blog post and there are, we're not finished. There are more things coming. Uh, the way I develop, I'm very conservative and I never break code. So we, you can use it in production now, it won't break. We're just going to add more powerful things. And uh, if you have thoughts and ideas, please ping me. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was a great overview of all that ecosystem of uh, future and future verse. So if uh, any of the participants have some questions or suggestions what to do next, uh, please. I have a question. So I am uh, regularly use the MCL apply approach mm -hmm. parallels, uh, but uh, I have a lot of issues. I, I use it a lot, a lot with the Terra library the one, you know, like for raster data, like GIS data. Mm -hmm. And it has a lot of issues with that. Have you heard anything about uh, using the future with the Terra library? Uh, so I think, uh, let's see if I actually even have an example of this. Um, let me, I'm going to look, I'm looking at my computer first on the web here. And if I, if I have it, I will share, show it. Um, Yes, I have one example. Let's see if I can share that. Now I'm going to try to share again. <laughs> sure. um, where, where are you? So I'm so confused now. I'm I'm not sharing anything yet. Oh, here we Watch go. It. Uh, here we go. Coming now. Sharing now. Yes. Okay. Um, so on the, in the future package, there is a vignette called non-exportable objects. And here I'm collecting, uh, objects that you cannot send to parallel worker, uh, or at least not without a lot of pain. Some objects can only exist on the in the R process that it was created. Um, and I think the Terra one, uh, so this might be one thing. Um, um, so I, I don't use Terra myself, uh, so I only have toy examples, but this is, uh, uh, if you try to use it with the uh, RL apply and things like this, you get like external pointers is not valid. Is that your experience? Okay, so that's why you use MCL apply, probably. I'm, I'm... Yeah, at the end, what I do is like at the end of the function, I save the the output as a TIFF file or whatever. And then on the next step, I just collect all those like manually yes. files. Yeah. Exactly, so that that's typically what you have to do. If, uh, it could be that if you use so this is an example where I use this uh, background R workers independent. 
and you would probably get an external pointer like this. If you use multi-core here, which corresponds to MCL apply, it might work here, uh, or it might not. It might crash uh, because Terra is not handling fork processing. So it's um, so your strategy is to um, send over the data so you can either reconstruct the object on the other side and then save it to file or encode it so it can safely be sent back. And there is this, the, do you know about the wrap? Okay, so there are, there are wrap and vect. I don't actually know why it's called vect. Wrap feels like uh, unwrap would be natural, but you can um, you can take the object you're interested in, the V here, and then you wrap it up in it. You encode it so it's safe to save to file or to send over to another work or used in later on. So instead of sending the original V here, you're sending the dot V wrapped up. And then I didn't show this, but this is future, basically the function future. This one takes that object. And the first thing the parallel worker is doing is unwrapping it to get that object on, of interest. And if you do it the other way around, if you create such an object, this one on a parallel worker, you have to wrap it when, before you send it back. Um, so th this concept is called, um, see if I have that, it's called Marshall. Um, so there is, in R we have serialized and unserialized, but can't take care of everything. There's a concept in programming called Marshall. So you Marshall and unmarshal. That means you wrap it up so it's safe to send it over and we can reconstruct that on somewhere else. Um, but this is work under progress, but several packages have their own homemade marshalling. So this would be Marshall, and that one would be unmarshal. Um, but there's no standard for this in R. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's a common problem, and it becomes more and more common as it happens to packages that rely on external software. So I've run into this as well. With the so term. there is, yeah, yeah so it's, but to your question, it's not like future is not magic and no other package is magic. They won't solve this for you. We have these limitations are like in R and basically independent of R too. Certain things can't be sent. Um, they can just Thanks. be made, made simpler <laughs> or less problematic. But in any case, I'm going to give it a try. <laughs> yeah, Sounds yeah. like very, really it's, interesting. Yeah, it's... Um, yeah, please do. Yeah, that resource is, is really useful because whenever I don't see the drop in compute time, then I'll have a look. And of course, it's listed there. Like XGBoost was another example. Or oh, yeah. Examples. And I didn't know why until I, I think you sent me that link before. And then I realized, oh, that's why. Okay. I mean, it just started out with a few examples. And the more questions I got, I decided to add them. Mm -hmm. And that, now I learn is like, yeah, I mean, there are more. So if you find other packages, please let me know because it's, um, it would be nice to have. Uh, the way I think about this, eventually some of these package authors, they don't think about this, mm -hmm. but maybe they will provide these wrap and unwrap functions or Marshall and Marshall functions. So who knows, from five years from now, this becomes much easier and less random. Um, I had another question, but I think you you answered that very well in the second half of the presentation because you had a slide when you were saying like it works ninety nine percent of the cases, and I was wondering what that one percent entails. But I think this uh, messages and warnings and uh, this marshalling thing could be what. Well, yeah. It's I mean, solid, I, but but yeah, you need to still be a bit cautious. Yep, yeah, it's um, it's there are things, small quirks in R that we can't fully automate, so we have to be aware of them. But point is that 
it's it shouldn't be a scientist people working on genomics or JS mm -hmm. uh, or whatever it's you shouldn't have to worry about how to mm -hmm. paralyze in especially not in the beginning you just want to focus on your study and then be able to scale it up when you have a ready pipeline you want to optimize it and make it super fast then you might have to start thinking about details mm -hmm. and parasitization is there a price that you have to to pay like you you remove all that clutter inside your function and now you can just rely on future to do the multi-session for you but if you do like each line using parallel with make cluster evacue whatnot uh is it faster or not really there i mean there is a little bit of overhead but not much it's fairly i mean if you go into very very small things that takes uh, some milliseconds or tenths of a second maybe it's like you notice a difference um, but the things that takes longer to run uh, it's yeah you don't notice it right then it's worth then is i think it's worth having all this protection mechanism built in you can disable a lot of things uh, mm -hmm. to make it slightly faster so the overhead is quite small yes when it takes an hour to go from one file to the other then i think that half a yeah. second is worth yeah. it yeah um, yeah no but i i think like yeah. if you have a function that takes uh, four seconds uh you won't notice much difference between parallel apply and mcl mm -hmm. apply and future apply so good point any more questions from people If there are no more questions, then uh, I thank you again for um, accepting this invitation. And uh, my pleasure. Um, thank you. I really enjoyed this talk and uh, hearing about the internals and just having it explained. I think it is much, much more different when it's coming from the creator of the package than reading the vignettes. So thank you for that. And uh, Thanks for the shout outs for the PB I'll apply <laughs> my small contribution, which now includes a future. So uh, it's important contribution. It's yeah. like you've got a lot of users out there. So uh, I can't wait to see where we are going to be in five years or even in a few months. So I'm excited to see where this all will lead us and all this good practice is uh, hopefully it will make some impact and people will will heed this advice and uh, and just do things and uh, leave leave it to the future package to to do the rest. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.